too. Sorry. Your notes. Oh, gosh. Yep, I can see them on the screen. I can stop it done. We're not live yet. Technically, are. Well, we need, we just want them to test real quick and then they can mute. Falcor, Falcor. This is Colleen in the studio. Can you hear me? Yeah, Colleen, we could hear you. Excellent. Yes, Colleen, we can hear you. Excellent. You guys sound pretty good. Uh, just so you know, we are broadcasting. We have eight minutes and 53 seconds on the clock uh, till the program will begin. So Alex will talk to you guys if he needs to do some testing. Otherwise, just stand by. Copy that. Standing clock. I am. Um, I have lost camera control of the fan for some time. This way? No, this way. I'm trying to get it so that you can see the screens and then have both of us in view. And you're probably not going to see both, but I don't know if I can see this. Right? Sure. How's that? Yes. So do you want? No, I'm not going to be resting screens. We just wanted to have something interesting in the backs of the screens. Um, so do you, can I tip it up a little bit? Are you okay with that? So it's not so much more So do you have a frame that's cutting out no, see when the lights are in it? Oops. Pretty much like this. Um, there. Which actually helps. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like your friends, like you like each other. I don't know about that. <laughs> Do um, yeah, I keep looking right just so you know, because that will be the screen, but I'll try not to do that during the show. So are you happy with that? I mean, you can't really see the TVs behind. Is that so? Does that not matter? It doesn't matter. Our ETO agrees with you. <laughs> you guys are beautiful. Should I make? Oh. Control. Sorry, I know I'm supposed to be on mute, but I just wanted to say, Falkor, you guys look really sharp. Thank you so much. Excited to see you guys today. Thanks. How is the video, everybody? Because an audio coders sort of 
taking over the chip internet. Thank you. 10 4. Excellent, thanks. Great, how are you, Alex? Yes, I did. And Roland, do you want me to mute um, in between takes or just leave it alone? All right, thanks. 10 4. Alex, are you? Same question. Are you guys going to handle the. Sorry, Alex, we're, we're, so we're listening. Yeah, we're talking to XP SPL and we're listening on an AX5A. Nautilus, Nautilus, Colleen. That's correct. I heard Alex. Yep. Yep. Nautilus, Nautilus, this is Colleen in the Inner Space Center studio. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Colleen. Colleen's a little quiet, quiet, but I think that it's she's much louder now than she was earlier, so it's getting better. So I can hear a little bit of an echo Ooh, coming an echo. from them. Ooh, I have an echo. So hey, Colleen. I'm the hey, sudden, Colleen. whatever just changed in the last couple of minutes. It was the what created the echo. She didn't have one before. She didn't have one before. Is somebody? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Nautilus, do you still hear an echo? Not on Dwight. Okay. Okay. I'm still hearing an echo from Nautilus. So I, uh, Casey on the Okeanos, this is Colleen. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Colleen. I can hear you pretty well. Okay, yeah, you sound really great. Your echo seems to have disappeared. That's excellent news. Let's go over to Wonderful. Falcor. Thank you. Falcor, can you hear me okay? We can hear you great, Colleen. Thank you. Okay, you guys sound good as well. Let's go back to Nautilus. Nautilus, can you guys hear me okay? Do you still have an echo? We can hear you. Okay, okay hear Colleen. You. Okay, it sounds like your echo is gone on my end.
welcome to the third annual World Oceans Day Tri-Ship Connection. I'm your host, Colleen Peters, and I'm coming to you live from the Inner Space Center, located in Narragansett, Rhode Island, at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. We have a very special program for you today. We will be talking to three unique ships that conduct scientific exploration and research all over the world. The Inner Space Center is the exclusive live streaming partner for two of these vessels using cutting edge technology to facilitate, capture, produce, and promote underwater exploration in real time. In today's program, we are going to learn where, why, and how each of these vessels explore in an effort to provide a better understanding of our world ocean. This can help lead to more effective management strategies and decisions. As a plank owner or first crew member of two of these vessels, it is with great pride that I introduce them to you today. Each one of these ships conduct similar operations, but in very different ways. So we will begin with a brief introduction from each group about what makes their ship and operations unique. Since we're located on the East Coast, we will begin with the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer, currently located at the pier in Charleston, South Carolina. It is operated by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. On board, we have Expedition Coordinator Casey Cantwell. Welcome, Okeanos. Tell us a bit about where, why, and how you explore. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so NOAA's ship Okeanos Explorer is the United States' only federal vessel dedicated to ocean exploration. 95% of our ocean is unknown, and Okeanos Explorer is working on reducing that number. Uh, so the Okeanos Explorer is, a, is run and uh, mission-driven through a partnership between NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research and the Office of, uh, the Office of Aviation um, and Marine and, Avi Marine and Aviation Operations. Um, the, all of our operations that we do are mission driven. We are driven by the community as a whole. So we work with managers and stakeholders to identify our priorities in areas where we're gonna be operating in the future to address their biggest data gaps and how that we can best help them uh, as they work through their ocean exploration uh, priorities. Um, we are able to explore at many scales with the Okeanos Explorer. We have a multi-beam system that allows us to look at uh, as well as two ROVs uh, that allow us to get a very close, detailed look at everything on the seafloor. So we're able to go not only from the multi-miles and down to tiny centimeters to look at what's on the seafloor. Thank you, Okeanos. Next, let's hear from the exploration vessel Nautilus, operated by the Ocean Exploration Trust and currently in transit off the coast of California. On board, we have digital media coordinator Samantha Wishnack and vice president of exploration and science operations, Nicole Renault. Welcome, Nautilus. Tell us about your program. Hello, everyone. Happy World Oceans Day. We are very happy to be joining you from the oceans. And this is the control van on Nautilus that you're viewing right now, where we're currently mapping off the coast of Southern California, just outside uh, Santa Cruz Island, which is part of the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And we're out here exploring the oceans with our vessel, the Nautilus. It's a telepresence equipped ship that allows us to involve everyone on shore as well as a team on board the ship. So we have remotely operated vehicles that do our underwater exploration and a high resolution mapping system that we use to locate targets of interest to understand the seafloor better. We're also going to places that are previously unexplored and bringing with us uh, not only other scientists, but the public and community through our Nautilus Live website. Uh, we have been out here for about a week now, and our season this year is spanning from June through mid-November, and it ranges from 
Southern California up to uh, Northern Canada and across to Hawaii, where we're working with partners in National Marine Sanctuaries, Marine Protected Areas, uh, researchers at universities, the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, amongst others. So we work with a wide variety of scientists to plan our exploration. And then also um, everything that we do is open to any scientists of who are interested in joining us from shore. So we have a large network of scientists who are able to join us because of telepresence, watch our Nautilus live streams and provide input to us, which is really powerful when we're out here in an ocean where we don't know what we're gonna find and they can always provide input and help. Um, a large part of our program, of course, is also internships and social media outreach to make the public aware of the importance of our oceans. So that's where Sam comes in. Um, she's really instrumental in making the the science that we do accessible to the public. And so we're really excited to be joining you today and happy to talk to you about our operations and get you excited about our oceans. Thank you, Nautilus. We're gonna get into much greater detail about everything that Nicole just mentioned. But for now, let's first find out what makes the FALCOR so unique. The research vessel FALCOR, operated by Schmidt Ocean Institute, is also working off the southern coast of California. On board, we have Marine Technician Deborah Smith and Lead Deckhand Michael Schooner. What can you tell us about the mission of the FALCOR? Hi, Colleen. Thank you for having us. Schmidt Ocean Institute is a nonprofit operating foundation. Established in 2009, FALCOR was launched in 2012 to help oceanographic research, discovery, and to um, catalyze the sharing of open data sharing. So Falcor currently, as you said, is off the coast of California. Um, we currently have an expedition that is searching for and tracking a ocean front of salinity. They are using multi-robotics to search with both unmanned aerial vehicles, underwater autonomous vehicles, as well as sail drones and Argo floats. Um, Falcor is really special in that it hosts both artists at sea and student opportunities, as well as provides um, competitive scientific um, expeditions to, to researchers. Falcor has a host of um, technology. They have high resolution multi-beam systems, as well as different in, um, oceanographic instrumentation on board. Um, but most importantly, we really provide a platform for worldwide scientists to do exploration, to come and do these really great multi-expedition missions um, where they can bring their new technology and test it out on the water. Thank you, Falcor. I just want to take a moment here to point out the awesome girl power we have present today, taking over uh, research vessels, one expedition vessel at a time. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Now we're going to dive a bit deeper with each of our vessels and learn about how their exploration efforts can help inform ocean management decisions to help better protect our ocean. But first, I'd like to start by talking about the technology that we're currently using. Many of you watching are likely familiar with apps such as FaceTime, Google Hangouts, or Skype to video chat. The Okeanos Explorer and Nautilus, in partnership with the Inner Space Center, have been building this type of technology for nearly a decade. In ocean science and exploration, however, we have a much fancier term called telepresence. This technology allows us not only to video chat, it allows scientists to conduct research without having to be on the vessel. So let's begin with Casey on the Okeanos. Casey, can you tell us how has the use of telepresence technology shaped your mission? from the way that we staff the ship to the way that we plan a cruise. Um, because of our telepresence technology, we are able to conduct multidisciplinary projects that you would really be not capable of conducting unless you had um, access to as much intellectual capital as we do through using telepresence. So with us on the ship, too, we only have two scientists on board at any one point in time. But through using the technology that Colleen was just telling you about, we're able to expand that to pretty much an unlimited science. 
we can have our team on board a geologic feature one day and working with the group of scientists from Hawaii and from the Netherlands and the other U.S. East Coast. And the next day we will be looking at a archaeology site. We'll look at a shipwreck and we've got scientists from all over the U.S. and then from um, American Samoa and Japan and China. And it's an really a great tool to be able to move from just working with one team of scientists on board, but then we're actually able to go beyond that and use anyone that we can uh, reach with an internet connection. There's literally no limit to what, who the scientists were able to reach. Um, and in addition to being able to use that telepresence technology to just provide data to people in real time, we're also able to use um, our high bandwidth satellite connection through a suite of internet-based collaboration tools. Uh, the collaboration tools not only provide feedback to us on the ship from our shoreside team about what we're finding, but it also allows them to annotate just as if they were here in the control room with us. We've really brought the experience of being here on the ship to folks at home. Uh, so it's a really really fascinating capability that we have uh, that has expanded our science team to more than any one research vessel in the world can carry. Um, the last cruise that I was on, we had 95 scientists participate from all over the world, and we had 16 different U.S. states and seven different countries participating. So it's a, it's a fantastic tool. Thank you, Casey, for that great overview. Um, it really is a great piece of technology that allows us to have so many more people participate in these great expeditions uh, than just the folks that are able to go out to sea. So I just also want to mention here that the Okeanos Explorer and Nautilus have this technology permanently integrated in the vessel, and the Inner Space Center can also provide this capability to vessels of opportunity through the use of mobile telepresence units. So you can learn more about these systems on our website, innerspacecenter.org. So besides telepresence, I would like to talk to Nicole on the Nautilus. Nicole, can you tell us about some of the other tools you use to explore? Which one is your favorite and why? Well, you know, my favorite happens to be the seafloor mapping system. I just love the idea that with um, just the technology that's on the hull of the ship, we can map an area that is many, many times wider than the vessel. So we're sending out sound in a fan shape that's mapping out thousands of kilometers to either side. And as we drive, progress over the seafloor, we're building these maps of areas that we don't have maps of. So uh, most of the ocean's seafloor hasn't been mapped. About uh, 10 to 13% of the seafloor has been mapped, which means the vast majority hasn't. Um, the rest of it may look mapped if you look at Google Earth, but it's really lacking the resolution. So it's about a three meter resolution on most of our seafloor. So anything smaller than that, we just simply don't know is there. So with just the mapping systems on Nautilus, we're able to make these amazing maps and find things on the seafloor. They also now capture water column information, so you're able to see where things like methane seeps are. And this is really important because as ships like ours drive over the seafloor, we're finding more methane seeps than we ever knew existed just off the coast of our own continental shelf. So just off of California and Washington and Oregon, we're finding thousands of methane seeps. And in fact, um, one of our future projects here is going to be to study those in more detail. Um, but for me, it's the mapping technology is the first step to finding that interesting location that we then use the remotely operated vehicles on for further exploration via you know, camera characterization of the seafloor or direct sampling with some of the tools that we're able to develop and use um, to help scientists get a closer look at what's down there. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, anybody that knows me knows I'm going to absolutely agree with you. Uh, seafloor mapping is one of my favorite tools. And the reason why it's one of my favorite tools is because it really is instant gratification. You know pretty much immediately uh, what you're looking at and that you've seen something new that people haven't seen before. And any time that the ship goes out to an area that hasn't been previously mapped, you're almost guaranteed to see something really new and exciting. So I've been working in this community for a number of years, and we use the word data a lot. Data quality, data analysis, data storage, data management, and data archive. It's a very small word with a very big meaning, depending on 
what you were talking about, and who you were talking to. So Casey, on the Okeanos, can you explain to us what kind of data are you collecting and why is it so valuable? Sure. So um, our sonar systems, our scientific sonar systems, collect um, a variety of data types. Uh, but essentially what they do is they make maps, uh, maps of the seafloor and they map the water column. So what exists in water between the surface of the, the surface of the ocean down to the bottom of the seafloor. Uh, and then we have a sonar system that also collects information about what happens just below the surface of the seafloor. Uh, and then when we use our ROVs, we're collecting collecting data about the, the conditions of um, the environment that we're looking at. So how much oxygen is there? How cold is it? Uh, what's the salinity like? Uh, what depth are we observing? So all the information, how much oxygen is available, is collected through our ROVs. And that really helps us be able to characterize a region simply because we're able to look at its geologic context with our seafloor maps down to the biological context and get the basic information that we need to establish what's here and how what lives here and how can they live here um, but one of the, my favorite parts about our data in our system is that all of our information that we collect is publicly available um, for our participating scientists we send all of our data to shore in real time uh, or with just a slight delay and then for anyone else who's interested in the expedition or following along with us all of our data is publicly available 60 to 90 days after an expedition, which is a rare time for our science team. Um, and our data is all available through the NOAA National Archives, uh, where people can go and just pull cruises that they're interested in and learn more about the ocean in some of the most remote places on Earth that we visited with Okeanos Explorer. Uh, and I'd say with either our mapping our ROV operations or uh, when we do ROV, either mapping or ROV operations, uh, we're always operating 24 hours a day. There's always something going on here in this control room, whether it be collecting uh, seafloor data, looking at what's in the water column, or whether we're actually diving. So during all of that time though, back to shore. So you can always follow along on oceanexplorer.noaa.gov to follow along and join us in our real-time data collection. Thank you for that, Casey. Uh, the Okeanos Explorer program has been a pioneer in making sure that all of the data that is collected is available to the science community and public in a very short order, just as Casey mentioned. You can also find Nautilus and Falcor data in the same repositories that she mentioned uh, um, managed by NOAA. So speaking about technology, I would like to turn to Deb, a marine technician on the Falcor. Deb, how has technology evolved from your perspective since you began working at sea? And how has that technology influenced the study of the ocean? Hi, Colleen. Thanks. Great question. Technology is really one of Falcor's main focus. It, um, our primary, one of our primary missions is to really help innovate technology, to bring on scientists who are developing new technology and give them a platform to really be able to test and use their technology. Um, I started in mapping almost 20 years ago. Um, like many of the other ships, we all have mapping systems. When I first started in hydrography, we were producing paper charts. We were still printing and plotting paper charts. And when I left about three years ago to join Falcor, we were actually delivering high resolution um, surfaces, which is what we also create on Falcor as well. Um, so technology has come a long way, both in the mapping field, but not as much as I see today in the autonomous world. Really autonomy, surface vessels, underwater vessels, um, aerial vehicles are really what's coming into the future. And it's been really exciting to start, start seeing how both engineers and scientists are working together. Our current cruise has a group of both scientists, um, physical scientists, chemical scientists, biological scientists, working right alongside engineers. And the engineers are helping the UAVs and AUVs all collect data, and then the scientists are processing that data. They're also developing some great software. We've worked, Falcor's worked with some really great programs um, in the past, both for um, video annotation and um, combined multi-vehicle mission um, display. Um, Squiddle Plus is our video annotation software. Um, we're currently using a really great program through LTS um, called Ripples. 
and um, it basically allows scientists to back on shore and you as well as the general public on shore to see where these vehicles are going, what they're doing, the data they're collecting. Um, and it also provides an opportunity for scientists at home if for some reason we lose connection with these vehicles to actually drive the mission. So all the way back in Portugal, they can actually change the vehicle path if needed. Um, so these are some really great platforms that are coming and emerging um, you know, right before our eyes. And so we're really fortunate to be able to provide this platform to worldwide scientists to be able to try all of this equipment together. One of the really neat technology, sorry, one of the really neat technologies we've used before on Falcor and have again is unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, they send a plane, basically vertical take off the deck and fly out and collect data for a number of hours and then come back and land back on the deck. And um, there are really some great new technologies emerging that are helping us collect ocean data better. And we really need to have this data as a combined collective, both engineers, software, scientists, to help us understand how to protect the ocean. Thank you, Deb. That's a really great summary. And while we're here on the Falcor, I'd like to ask Michael a question. So, Michael, while you are working on the deck, constantly looking at the ocean, what are some of the largest threats to the ocean that you have seen as you have sailed around the world? Well, thanks for me. For my whole career at sea, I noticed that um, the biggest threat to the ocean is actually a human impact. And one of our footprints, which is very easily visible, is plastic in the ocean. And it's from microplastic, which is just littering in the water, um, up to floating unmanned nets, which are just like trash floating throughout the ocean. And wherever you are on the world, whatever, yeah, kind of um, ocean or see you going, you can find that everywhere. And that's quite scary. Luckily on the Falco we have sometimes the ability and the chance, the time and the weather condition to collect some of that garbage, some of that fishing net. But you can imagine that whole container ship with around about fifteen thousand fifteen thousand containers um, couldn't stop and just get some people in the water to get the nets out. Um, and even we on Falco can't always get those nets out of the water. So that's quite frustrating. Thank you, Michael. Unfortunately, this kind of problem has become all too common. I would like to take a moment here to remind everyone that the action focus for World Oceans Day 2018 is preventing plastic pollution and encouraging solutions for a healthy ocean. While it's not always possible, as Michael mentioned, sometimes these vessels can recover some of the debris that they encounter. There are, however, a number of programs that are dedicated to this issue directly, such as the NOAA Marine Debris Program, the Ocean Cleanup, and Clean Ocean Access, just to name a few. You can find more information about all of these organizations and others like them online. So while we are on that note, Michael, how does working on FALCOR change your perspective of ocean conservation and the ability to share that message with others? Yeah, Corrine. Um, me working on the port of FALCOR, um, I've been to really remote islands, um, which are sanctuaries, and just a few people got the ability to go there. and. Um, there and everywhere else you can find animals like dolphins, whales, or even underwater animals. And um, yeah, they are just exposed to this polluted environment. And I found that it's our responsibility to take care of that problem. And it's our job also to educate and uh, make the next generation aware of that global pollution. And I find that just tiny, small change could already make a big change on that impact. And therefore, when I'm at home and working at school theory in a general scout group, um, I encourage the scouts to take a look 
at their own environment and make them aware how they actually can prevent that big impact and reduce their own footprint. Thank you, Michael. That's really great to hear. And I just want to say thank you for all your efforts, both on and off the FALCOR. You are very much correct. We can't change anything unless people are aware of the problem. So speaking of awareness, Deb, can you tell us about how the FALCOR is helping to better inform people about the ocean? And how does this influence conservation and protection of these remote areas in which you survey? Yeah, thanks, Colleen. Um, FALCOR typically sails with an onboard multimedia correspondent. This person really embeds themselves in the science team. They gather the information that the scientists are trying to learn, also some real-time results. It really allows them to tell the message off the ship. We do this in a number of ways, daily 4K highlight videos, blogs. Um, we also do ship-to-shore interactions, which allow us to connect with schools and the general public, much like the one we're doing today. Um, we also um, are able to bring on additional people like students at sea and artists at sea that help tell the story in a different way. Our artists at sea program really allows somebody who wouldn't necessarily get on the ocean um, and be able to interact with scientists and tell their story in a unique way by being able to do different mediums, maybe watercolor or, um, or drawing or painting um, or sculpture or knitting and then be able to take that artwork and share it in our traveling exhibit um, throughout the United States and hopefully soon other places as well. It really helps us be able to share the message of what's happening on board, which is really important to share that research so that people can understand the processes and the things that are going on in the ocean. Great, thank you very much, Deb. I personally think that the FALCOR does a really great job with their outreach during the cruises. And I particularly enjoy watching the weekly highlight videos. As Deb mentioned, you can follow along with the cruise blog on SchmidtOcean.org. Moving over to the Nautilus, Samantha, I would like to hear from you about how and why Nautilus makes such an effort toward communicating science, and how can the public get involved with the Nautilus? Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, Nautilus has a, a pretty unique uh, outreach component built into our mission. So we have a 24-hour live stream running at nautiluslive.org um, from June. So we just started it a couple days ago all the way until the end of November. So you can tune in any day um, during those six months and see what is happening live in ocean exploration. Right now we are currently in transit, so you'll see some uh, operations on our back deck. Um, but as we start our ROV, our remotely operated vehicle dives on June 12th, you'll actually be able to see underwater with us and hear um, our team as we're exploring live. So we're actually in our control van right now here on Nautilus um, in the seats that will be filled by a much larger team when we start those ROV dives. So we have navigators and um, ROV pilots and scientists and a video engineer. Um, and then we actually have in our control van for every single watch, a science communication fellow. So we actually have um, an educator, either a formal classroom teacher or an informal educator from museums or aquariums um, or even uh, you know, kind of anyone who's telling the science of, or the, the story of science, um, we, we welcome them out as science communication fellows. And they're actually embedded in the control van as part of the expedition team to help us communicate what we're doing out to the outside world. So they're kind of the, the questions that we all have. Um, they're the ones who are able to ask them and then also bring in questions from the audience. So if you watch with us on Nautilus Live, you'll, you can actually send in questions to our audience or to our explorers and have um, us answer them in real time. Um, we're also, uh, as Nicole mentioned, we're, we're pretty active on social media. So we're trying to show um, anyone watching, you know, what's going on behind the scenes. On Nautilus Live, we show you what's happening underwater, or what's happening on deck, but, you know, what's happening in the wet lab to all the samples that we collect during the season? Um, what's happening in the ROV hangar when the ROVs are back on deck and there's maintenance happening? Um, we, we try to give you the whole picture. Since, science, since ocean exploration can seem like something that only a few select people get to do, we try to really open it up and show that lots of different people with different backgrounds um, are needed and are necessary to, to have ocean exploration happen in real time. Um, we offer opportunities for students and um, both of undergraduate and graduate level students, internships in ROV engineering, video engineering, seafloor mapping, and ocean science. So lots of opportunities for students and educators to come out um, 
understand what ocean exploration is like firsthand and then bring those experiences back to their communities. So I think in answer to your question, uh, for us, you know, sort of showing the behind the scenes of the science makes it something that's more accessible and more achievable for any of those future explorers who might be watching at home. Great, thank you so much, Samantha. I personally think that the Science Communication Fellowship is one of the un most unique features of the Nautilus program, and more information and application instructions can be found on oceanexplorationtrust.org. The next question is for Casey on the Okeanos. You explained earlier about what kind of data you collect. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that data can be used to inform ocean management strategies or decisions? So Colleen, I would first answer that with a question back to you. How can you manage something that you don't understand or you don't know enough about? Uh, for example, if we were talking about you moving to a new apartment, for example, and we were trying to figure out what size your new apartment and what, how big of a room do you need? Well, we would need to understand how big your furniture was, what's your favorite colors, where do you need, where do you work, where do you need to go every single day, uh, what, do you like to cook, do you not like to cook? All of those sort of primary questions would help us understand what kind of apartment you would be moving into next. Well, now if you think about the ocean and some of our marine nat national marine monuments and sanctuaries and all of the marine resources that we have on the seafloor, you need to understand who lives there, what that environment looks like. Does it change from day to day? Does it change from year to year? How do the organisms that live there live there? What do they do? How, do, how does their life history impact the world around them? How is the world around them impacting their life history? So without being able to answer some of those fundamental questions of what's there and what, what exists fundamentally begin to manage something. So with that in mind, um, over the last couple of years, uh, the Okeanos Explorer has been working in a partnership um, with National Marine Fisheries Service and the National Ocean Service uh, to explore some of the National Marine Sanctuaries in the Pacific. Uh, this campaign just wrapped up last fall, but our primary for going out to the Pacific was to get some of the deep water areas that, that people had the opportunity to be at before. In some of the areas where we were exploring, they are the most remote areas on Earth, definitely the most remote parts of our country. Uh, and we were oftentimes closer to the satellites above us than we were human being on land or to another city. So that just gives you an idea of how remote we were during these expeditions. And a lot of those areas had never had So some of the maps that we were collecting were the first ones that had ever been produced. And then the ROV dives that we were conducting were the first opportunity to take a look at the seafloor in those areas. Thank you very much, Casey. Now I would like to talk about the excitement of discovery. This is why we do it. This is why the ships even leave the dock to find out these new and interesting things about our oceans. So Nicole on the Nautilus, can you explain what is the coolest part of your job? What is it that makes you really giddy, really excited to wake up in the morning? And have you had any surprises from recent exploration? Sure, thank you, Colleen. I think the excitement of my job is multifaceted. I mean, on the surface, we're uh, going to new places and finding new things, but what's really cool is when someone makes a discovery off of those things. So being the first person to see something is nice and exciting, but then it's the discovery that's made when someone, either in our network of scientists or someone who gets a sample after the fact says, gee, I've never seen this before. It's something brand new to discover. So uh, that's what gets me really excited in the morning. And, and certainly from our past expeditions in the last year, we've made a couple of new species discoveries. Um, one was just announced by Cordell Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, this is an area just off of Central California, off the San Francisco area, where we found two new sponge species. And so it was really exciting to be able to work with scientists there who are then partnering with a scientist actually in Canada at a museum who made the discovery that we had found these two new sponges. 
Um, and so this is happening oftentimes after a cruise, but sometimes we have these scientists who are also following along with us uh, during exploration, writing into us through our science chat, telling us that uh, they've never seen that before, and we're able to help them by getting samples and providing those to them. So, you know, my job is exciting because I get to work with this multidisciplinary team of scientists who make these discoveries, and also getting to hear the stories back about what we've discovered. So. Um, feel very lucky to be out here with a great team of people, both on the ship and on shore. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, that was a really great sort of explanation of all of the excitement that you can encounter when you have the opportunity, not only to sail on the vessel, but also when you follow along online. So moving over to Samantha on the Nautilus as well, what are you most proud of in your line of work? So speaking of being able to follow along online, um, I think for me, it's seen some of the things that we see on the ship go around the world. So we are here out in the middle of the ocean and um, you know, thanks to our team of 48, that's 31 science and expedition team members um, and, and 17 professional crew who are making sure that the ship is running and that we're all happy and safe on board. Um, thanks to this team, we're able to send you know images of the deep sea all around the world. Um, so for me, it's really exciting and um, you know, to, to see those those sightings go around the world, like the googly-eyed stubby squid that you might have seen from a couple years back, um, or the deep staria jelly, a kind of bag-like jelly that um, we were able to capture uh, sort of undulating through the water column. Um, being able to see sightings like that go around the world and capture people's imaginations, not necessarily um, always because of the sighting itself, but also because of the reactions of all of our team. Um, as mentioned, we have a lot of different people here up here in the control van. So it's really fun to see how people connect with someone that maybe sounds like them um, out on the ship. So they can say, oh yeah, you know, this sounds like someone, something like I would say, um, you know, scientists aren't necessarily always, don't always have the answers. Um, you know, sometimes they're actually really having fun and exploring just the same way we are. So for me, it's being able to make those connections between what we're doing and, um, you know, between the different uh, career pathways that might be available to someone who wants to, to join us out here or enter a field in, um, in the STEM fields. Thank you so much, Samantha. I think that, uh, as you mentioned, just being able to sort of hear people's reactions to things as they are being seen live from that control van uh, just reminded me of one of the clips that you guys had a while back about the sperm whale that suddenly appeared in the view of the ROV, and that one I think also went pretty viral besides the uh, googly-eyed squid. So that's what you guys are watching right now is this clip that I just mentioned. Um, this was just a really great example of people hearing that excitement as it was happening uh, on Nautilus Live. So uh, all these kinds of clips uh, and more can be found again on Nautilus Live and their YouTube channel. So on the Okeanos, I would like to find out from Casey, what is the coolest thing that the Okeanos has discovered and why? So that would be such a personal question that is going to vary depending on the team member that you talk to. My personal favorite thing that we found uh, was actually our the last expedition that I was on, which was to explore the musician seamounts, which are northwest of the Hawaiian Islands. And they were an area that had never really been mapped except for a couple transit passes in an area that had zero ROV exploration before we got there. And what we found was just astounding. Um, they, every amount that we visited had a high density deep sea coral community. And when you think about biodiversity and sort of the rainforests of the sea, that's what these communities were like. It was absolutely incredible. Every dive was different and unique, but they were all incredibly wonderful. I'd like to mention here that the Okeanos Explorer Video Bites are available on the Inner Space Center YouTube channel and produced highlights are available on oceanexplorer.noaa.gov to watch during and after the cruise. Nautilus videos, as I had mentioned previously, are available on the Nautilus Live website and YouTube channel, and FACOR videos can be found on their cruise blogs and on the Schmidt Ocean Institute YouTube channel. Lots of great resources for everything under the sea. So today we have talked about where why and how these vessels explore 
but how does one get to do that? Deb on the Falcor, do you have any words of wisdom for someone interested in going to sea? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Colleen. That's a great question. Um, there are many ways to get into the field of exploring the ocean and working at sea. Um, it can be anywhere from biology to engineering. But what I really find is important is you're really passionate about what you're doing and find a program that really helps you learn that and explore that passion. Um, whether it's driving ships or programming software or studying a particular type of fish, it really is important to find the right school, the right program, and do as much internship as possible. Get out there, explore the world, travel, um, and you will find that eventually that travel will probably take you to a ship. Um, we have had a number of different opportunities on Falcor between students, graduate students, high school students, um, <clears throat> artists at sea who never expected to be on the ocean. We have an anthropologist on this trip studying how all these people work together. Um, we have had programmers who never thought they'd get out of the office and have um, ended up on a ship. So I really think that whatever it is that you find you want to do, do it with passion, find a really great program that explores that passion, and then really work your way to the ocean and work your way to a ship, and it'll come. Thank you, Deb. I definitely agree that finding an opportunity uh, such as an internship, apprenticeship, or volunteer work uh, can be a great way to figure out what really suits you, uh, get a feel for a career, uh, no matter what industry you're in. Casey, on the Okeanos, while it may not be possible for some folks to see, how can they otherwise follow along with the Okeanos expeditions? So the Okeanos Explorer, uh, is about to leave on a 22-day expedition to the southeast uh, area off of the U.S. Um, seaboard where we're going to be looking at the changes of environment and the deep sea habitats in the, off the uh, U.S. continental shelf. So if you're interested in following along with us, starting on Monday, we'll be underway. Uh, and you can follow along on oceanexplorer.noaa.gov. Uh, we also have a very active presence on social media, on our Facebook page, our YouTube channels, uh, Facebook and or Instagram and Twitter as well. Uh, throughout the cruise, we take questions on any of our social media accounts, so just follow along and ask a question. And during the dives, we'll, we'll answer them. Uh, we also have a Reddit AMA coming up on uh, June 14th. So that's a gr another great opportunity for folks to ask their questions and learn a little bit more about life at sea, the kinds of things that we're going to be doing over the next couple days, uh, and some of the fun things that we've discovered in the past. Uh, and as always, you can always tune into oceanexplorer.noaa.gov and follow along with our expedition in real time and essentially be an armchair explorer with us. Thanks for that, Casey. We will, of course, be following all of the upcoming expeditions from the Inner Space Center. So as we approach the end of our time together, I would like to go around to each vessel for one final question. On the Okeanos, Casey, what is the one thing you miss the most while you are at sea? So I should say my husband. <laughs> But I'm going to say my dog, uh, because he can't read emails and text messages and receive phone calls the same way that my husband can. That's a pretty good answer. I feel a little sorry for your husband right now, but you must have a really great dog. Um, I don't have any pets, so I can't uh, say that I feel the same. But what I miss the most usually is my bed, because it's not moving. So on the Nautilus, Nicole and Samantha, what is the one thing that you cannot go to sea without? For me, it's good coffee. Coffee keeps me running. For me, it's chocolate bars so you can trade and make new friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Yeah, I definitely agree with Samantha on the chocolate. Uh, I, would, I would probably agree with Nicole well, as well on the coffee. But what I would say here is shipmates don't let shipmates quit their vices while at sea. That's bad news for everybody. Finally, the most important question of the day is for the research vessel Falcor. Inquiring minds need to know, what is being served for lunch? Well, Colleen, I hope we don't make you all too jealous, but our chefs, that's right, we have two of them, 
have provided us a little bit of an ocean extravaganza for World Oceans Day. Um, we have a bit of a seafood um, medley. Uh, so we have some tuna poke, we have a cold shrimp salad, we have a lobster bisque, we have some tuna steaks, and we have a pork adobe for those who don't really like seafood. Um, Michael, you were at lunch. I haven't yet had it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was it good? It was really great. And of course, we got a nice green salad as usual. Um, we got as well um, sashimi. We got, of course, rice, which keeps us all running. And then, as a nice dessert, we got special World Ocean Day cake, which is covered nice blue like the ocean is right now outside. Awesome. Well, that sounds delicious. I am maybe not so jealous of the seafood part. I don't actually eat seafood, but I know a lot of you out there do and probably are quite jealous at this point of the feast that you guys are having on board. So I'm really glad to hear uh, that you have a nice treat for World Oceans Day. Uh, one thing that folks often take for granted is how important it is to have good food on a ship. The galley really is the center of good morale on a vessel. So I'm glad to hear that you guys are keeping that up. So on that note, we had better let you all get on with your day so Deb can have lunch and we can conclude our program. I hope that our viewers have learned something new about where, why, and how each of these vessels explore the world ocean. Where? All over the world, exploring the global ocean. Why? For understanding our oceans to be able to make better decisions, and how with technology such as seafloor mapping, remotely operated vehicles, and of course, telepresence. I would like to thank all of our participants from the three vessels for taking time out of their busy schedules to interact with us for the third annual World Oceans Day Tri-Ship Connection. I would like to thank all of the ship's crews for keeping these vessels running 365 days a year the Shoreside support staff for their efforts to coordinate this event. Of course, our viewers for joining us. Without you, we wouldn't even have this program. And last but not least, the Inner Space Center production team, without whom this edition would not have been possible. We hope that you have enjoyed the program and invite you to follow all of our organizations on our websites and social media for the most up-to-date crew schedules, live video, and news from the expeditions. And until next year, I hope that you will continue to explore with us.